Welcome back to AWS On Air Live at reInvent. I'm A.M. Grabelny, one of your hosts, joined by... Everyone, I am Jeff Marushak. I'm a senior solutions architect on our DoD Air Force team, and I'm really excited to talk yeah. about yet another SageMaker Hold on, feature. I've got something for this, right. Jeff. Hold on, hold on. So we're, we're with SageMaker Notebooks, the next generation. So fans of Degrassi or Star Trek, Wait, you're yeah, in luck. If you say the next generation, the if, next you, generation. if you think Degrassi, there's something, you should not be thinking Degrassi. Excuse me? Are you Canadian? I'm going to leave right now if you keep this up. Drake, was Drake around here? Prashant, Sean, please save us from this <laughs> argument. Uh, introduce yourselves. Uh, sure, I was actually enjoying that. But, um, <laughs> I'm Prashant, I'm a principal product manager with SageMaker. Okay, and uh, my name is Sean Morgan. I'm a senior machine learning solutions architect here at AWS. And let us know in chat, because we are watching chat, Jeff and I, uh, if you have any questions. And if you think Degrassi is the superior next generation to Star Trek, but I I'm sure after Prashant and Sean are done today, SageMaker Notebook, the next generation, will surpass both, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Is that right? That's okay. So I know uh, we've got a demo that's going to take a bit of time. So we may want to just jump right in and just show people what's different about this generation of SageMaker Notebooks. Sure. Prashant, do you want to start with kind of an overview of the, the yeah, three yeah, 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 maybe. And I'll, we'll get right into it. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Absolutely. So, I mean, Notebooks revolutionized data science and machine learning, right? And we, uh, SageMaker launched the first IDE for end-to-end -end machine learning in 2019. Uh, lets you do everything from data preparation, uh, building in your notebooks, deploying, and then monitoring those models. Uh, but what we see is that a lot of uh, data scientists and machine learning practitioners are still spending a lot of time on tedious uh, mundane stuff. Data uh, prep. Yeah. Yeah, yep. yeah. So, I mean, they're writing boilerplate code to visualize data. Um, it's, it's hard to collaborate, they have to share notebooks over email or chat, um, and then a lot of data scientists don't really want to learn like DevOps practices and tools to productionize their notebooks. So there's quite a bit of uh, you know, the improvement there that can happen, and so that's what we've done. Uh, we've launched a host of uh, new features to address each of those things. But DevOps is pretty cool, so um, <laughs> you might want to rethink that, just say. Uh, oh, no, yeah, I mean, I uh, absolutely. Uh, anyway. it's, but there are people that are not... I know, you know I know. I, I don't, I don't learn as much machine learning as I should as a DevOps practitioner. So. Well, there you go. It's, just, it's some give and take. But, I know, I know. But uh, I'm but out yeah. there and I'm putting in the work, so <laughs> think about it. Go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, we, we hope you like it. And Sean here is going to walk you through how some of these things work, all the way from like data visualization, collaboration, mm -hmm. to productionizing your notebooks. If there's one thing we've seen with SageMaker over the years has been the improvement with original SageMaker, then SageMaker Studio, and now SageMaker the next generation with <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm the, yeah I'm, I'm starting to like the name yeah. probably make it official <laughs> I love it so what it, let, can we let's see let's see the new notebooks new yeah. SageMaker let's step on over here so today we're going to talk about three distinct features the first one is collaborative shared spaces in SageMaker Studio it enables users to collaborate in real time on the same files and the same notebooks so in this hypothetical situation here uh, we're looking at a, uh, any company sustainability research division, and we have two users attached to this SageMaker domain. Within our space management, you can see that we have two distinct spaces, shared spaces. We have the electricity consumption shared space, as well as the air quality study. You're meant to use these shared spaces for distinct machine learning endeavors. So you can think of them as kind of a project that you're all collaborating on at the same time. Would there be one notebook per space? Yeah, so you'll actually have the ability to, and I'll jump right over, if I were to launch a collaborative space okay. as a user, um, I'll go ahead and launch the air quality study, and I would land in this page here. Oh, it nice. looks like you know your typical personal studio application, but the uh, EFS file directory here is actually shared between all users that join this particular space. Oh. So we can all collaboratively edit the same notebooks and we can have distinct areas where we keep data that we want to share and things along those lines. If you look at the top right here, you can see that uh, my user is Sean-user and I am part of the air quality study space. So let's go ahead and start diving into some notebooks where we're going to see some collaborative features as well as some features that really uh, alleviate some of those mundane tasks that Prashant was talking about in the start. The first mundane task that we've seen as people develop in Jupyter Notebooks with SageMaker Studio is data preparation. Yep. 
So we've seen through time that you know, a lot of the tasks that people need to do as they go about building data sets for their machine learning models is pretty repetitive and a lot of boilerplate code. So we're happy to introduce SageMaker Data Wrangler built-in data preparations within the notebooks. By seamlessly importing SageMaker Data Wrangler library, we can then go ahead and generate visualizations and insights on our data. In this example, I'm going to load a pandas data frame, and when I go ahead to query that data frame, you'll notice that it will automatically render a number of different distributions of the data set, as well as insights that we can go ahead and use. Gotcha. This particular data set is the Titanic data set, kind of a hello world of machine learning, where we're trying to use uh, information to determine really? if these passages are that. That's the hello uh, world uh, of uh, that's one awesome. of them. Yeah, yeah. For, uh, you know, using background information. It's a tragic story, <laughs> but uh, you can find a lot of insights based on like the fares that they paid and things like that on who got to the lifeboats. Um, I learned something new. If, if I check the pa view pandas table here, you can see what this would have traditionally looked like without the data preparation capability. Basically, a tabular view of the data without a ton of um, you know, insights generated to the user. With the data wrangler table, I can see right away the kind of distributions of my data sets, which is helpful as I build my machine learning models. I can also see the percent of, from this uh, stacked bar chart here, like the percent of missing data. And if I go ahead and scroll here to the side, I can see uh, outliers as well uh, that are highlighted. So I can see that there is you know, outliers within the ticket data class. I'm gonna go ahead and do some graphical uh, data munging here. I'll go to the uh, cabin category where I can see already there's something unique going on here. So by selecting this little warning sign here, I can see that there is over 1,100 missing values and only a total of 1,400 values. Uh, so right away, this is likely not the most salient feature I wanna use in my machine learning model. So if I go to the data quality tab, I can actually have the ability to put uh, automated recommended fixes for this. Oh, nice. Yeah, so by just graphically touching, uh, you know, the way I want to fix this, and you can see that the missing values is a high problem, I can go ahead and drop this co column by simply collect selecting this button. This is one of the most tedious things. It really is. So, like, you know, traditionally, you could plot all of these distributions. You could go about looking through it. It's just many, many cells, and it takes a long time. And it's yes. really not unique to solving your business problems. So. And the larger your data set, the larger yeah, the problem. Yeah, exactly. It right. just keeps compounding on itself. So I'm going to do a couple more transformations to show some really unique features here. Uh, for the fair, which I know is a pretty important feature value, so I don't want to drop this column, but I do need to fill in some missing values. So I'm going to use replace with median as kind of a best guess for what the customers were paying uh, for that uh, tickets. You can see my distribution updates in real time, and you can see that I filled in a lot of those missing values with the same median value. So that's where that kind of diagram looks like here. You're getting uh, some some call some shout outs in, in chat. Automated fixes are great. Nice, so. glad to hear. And you're gonna like the next part of it too. These automated fixes I'm doing, yeah. they actually generate the code in the cell below. So as I mean, you go I didn't about mention programmatically the string it. of emojis that that <laughs> that are celebrating this nice. also. So glad you to are hear. Um, you're one, landing this. Yeah, perfect. One final really unique feature about this is that it's tailored for machine learning. So if I go ahead and pick a target like survived and I go ahead and select this as the target column, I can actually tell the data preparation, what am I trying to build here? Am I building a classification model or a regression model? So if I choose classification model, it will then generate insights that are specific to building machine learning models. In this case, it's telling me that I have rare target values. So I have some classes here uh, that occur very rarely, and you're likely not going to be able to build a model that can accurately predict those. So I'm gonna go ahead and just simply drop those rare uh, target values um, and we can see that now I just have two categories of zeros and ones, which is perfect for bringing into my machine learning model. I think you just made a fan for life, Sean, because uh, right before you showed that, yeah. the question was, I wonder if this concept could AI autocomplete code as well? Well, yeah, maybe. And then, <laughs> guess what? Perhaps perfectly in the future, but yeah, it's yeah. really coming in here. So all of those graphical uh, commands that I inputted are actually generated below the cell as uh, code that's been already written uh, so I can now programmatically run this notebook and I no longer need to graphically do this. So it's a super helpful feature just to kind of alleviate some of the, uh, the, the manual process. The next thing that I want to show is the collaborative model building. The, you know, we talked about how these are shared spaces, so what does this look like for multiple users that are trying to build a model together? I'm going to go ahead and uh, import uh, some data sets that I've already kind of prepared. This is a 
uh, nitrogen dioxide uh, concentration count versus the weather in an area. So we're trying to predict, can you predict the amount of nitrogen dioxide in the area based off the wind conditions and things along those lines? Okay. Uh, you know, for, As you do. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you're doing uh, sustainability research like right. we're doing in this shared space. Uh, or no. just like, you know, Thursday for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, Thursday yeah. afternoon, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so what do you do after saying hello world is... That's yeah. right. <laughs> You've been <laughs> right to that. Is yeah. this the hello world of weather prediction? Yeah. So again, I'm going to go ahead and just make one small um, automated thing here. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, replace with the median for the visibility of uh, the column. There was one missing value in this data set. Now, this time you can see how we actually use that <laughs> to go ahead and generate the code below. And I'm going to go ahead and continue with this machine learning model building process uh, and merge those data frames and together. And you're running each of these steps as you're going yeah, down, Yes, so I'm right. just kind of, you know, for the sake yep. of time, I'm running yep. a little quickly here. Uh, but you can see, uh, if we look at, say, the wind speed versus the, the nitrogen dioxide concentration, there's a pretty clear correlation. So we likely can be able to build a machine learning model. Now imagine that I'm kind of a subject matter expert in uh, weather patterns or, you know, uh, sustainability. And I really want to pair with, say, uh, my partner, Prashant, or Sumit, who's more of a machine learning expert. Okay. That's when these collaborative environments can really come together so that, let's say that I build just a linear regression model, I can score my model, and I see that it's 0 0.18, not quite as high as I want it to be. So I can call in a, a, a peer to say, hey, can you help me with this model building process? I'm going to jump to split screen here where you can imagine that now I'm running as a separate uh, user in this screen. And if I come down to uh, this tab here, I can actually go ahead and see on the left side of the screen that I can see the cursor in real time. So I can type and I can make it so that, you know, I can see the submit user on my left-hand screen. So it's collaboratively at the same time we can be editing code. Sumit's so behind the camera somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah he's, he's, that's the idea. Somewhere, exactly. yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and go ahead and try a new type of model, a, a random forest regressor, which applies a bit of nonlinearity to our model. And we can see that I've now kind of drastically improved the model 0.21. Uh, so in this way, you can kind of alleviate this process of, you know, beforehand, I would have had to save that notebook, right. email it to my colleague, have them make edits, send it I back. I was going to ask, how do you do this before? It was, you were, you were probably on a call with one person saying, oh, like, can you go to like the line where you're doing the, the, the model thing? And then the right. other person is like, oh, line 16? Where Which line? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Oh, wow. So now it's, okay. yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, it's tough to find uh, an expert in weather and machine learning. They're pretty <laughs> yeah. rare. You've got one sitting right here, obviously. Right, Trent right. Sean, I guess, yeah. yeah. With Jeff, not me. Okay. Jeff, Thank right? you. Thank so you. Yes. one thing I wanted to call out with these shared spaces is that when I go to view something like SageMaker Experiments from this shared space, I'm only going to see experiments that are related to this particular ML endeavor. It filters it down so that the only you know, model registry or experiments that you see here are related to this shared space, which really helps to organize your processes as you're building. The last feature we're going to cover in today's demo is scheduling these notebooks, either as a batch job or a repeated pattern. Oh, yeah, because sometimes you want to run these exactly. all the time, so right? You, you You're mentioned getting before data coming DevOps, in. Um, yeah. And, you know, totally agree that for some production models, like, you need to go through different processes uh, right. to make sure that they can run in production. You need to come talk to your friends at DevOps, exactly. too, and, and, and what build if you don't relationships. Have a friend? Exactly. Yeah. So we find all kinds of you don't have friends. I'm your friend. Where there's just one person who's wearing all of the hats. Yeah. And uh, what you can do here is, you know, I already have a notebook that runs successfully in the particular kernel that I'm running. Why do I need to then go convert this notebook into a Python script, find okay. a container that can properly run it, that had the same dependencies as my notebook? And so what we've done is we've alleviated that problem so that you can now run notebooks as productionalized jobs. So you got cron notebooks. Yes, exactly. Basically, uh, yeah. That's right. exactly what it is. And so in this example here, you can also modularize and parameterize your notebook. So in this case, I have a, a variable known as days back. I'm trying to predict that nitrogen dioxide concentration from two days ago. But what if I wanted the job to be able to say, you know, run this job, but maybe one day ago or three days ago? You can go ahead and tag this cell as a parameter. And when we go to build the notebook job, I can actually change that value. So I can reuse the same notebook for different tasks. Wonderful. To run this as, an, as a job, I simply click this button right here, which says create notebook job, if I stop moving my cursor. And we'll be taken to a screen where we can generate this as a job. I can say my notebook job, I'll name it, and I will go ahead and select the compute type that I want to use. Yep. 
You could use GPUs if you're doing model training, or you could do a lightweight instance if you're doing some kind of analytics, say, you know, how much did we spend on SageMaker yesterday? And it's a yep. daily report that you want to generate. There's the ability to add those parameters, so I can do like days back, back. and I'll set it to one day back so that I can now have a different functionality using the same notebook. There's advanced options. I can set the kernel that I want this to run with, as well as the ability to set the role I want to run the, the job with, environment variables, or even startup scripts if you need to install packages and things like that uh, to make sure that your notebook will run successfully. Cool. I see here is where we want to run this on a schedule, right? Yes, exactly. So you have the Run Now button, but you can also run it on a schedule. And for the schedule, we have pre-built things like weekdays, weeks, months, or a custom schedule with your favorite cron Well, that Yeah, that looks really right familiar there. right there. Yep. That's amazing. I mean, we're short on time, unfortunately. Yep. Uh, let's see if we can. Last thing I want to show yeah. is that when you have these schedules running, you can view them in real time. You can pause them. And a, a completed notebook uh, will actually render the output of your job. So I can see if you wanted to have plots or anything like that. And so you can use this as a daily report or running inference as needed. I yeah. love it. Yeah, so uh, it, it's nice to see notebooks, number one, coming into more services. We talked to Athena earlier today, but now even improving notebooks and just like you guys are doing. So guys, thanks for coming out with us. AM, you want to take us out? Sure, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if we figured out which is the next generation best. I'm going to throw a third one in there, too. Okay. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the next generation. That's on the list, too. But I think maybe SageMaker, the next generation, <laughs> won it out in the end. Prashant, uh, yep. Sean, Prashant, Sean, thank you both for joining us. We'll be right back.